I had to go to that necessary place. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Father's Arms Fellowship Sunday night feasting on the Word. We're going to sing one or two times something uh, through, and then I'm going to turn this over to Nancy. We're going to sing. Oh, oh, oh.
position after me. Greater is he, Greater he that's in me than he, than he that is in the world. Jesus lives in me. Amen. That means the greater one lives in us. Go ahead and do your hymn. You wanted to do this hymn. Yeah, I'm doing that. There's four verses I don't want to do long. Well, you do as many of them as you want. I think Zach's got them all up there. If you just... I think it's good. I mean, we're going to hear a testimony tonight, and it's always great to know and remember that Jesus paid. Oh, yeah. him. Oh, oh him tonight. Jesus paid it all. I'll start with the first. Jesus paid it all. set of lights out there. Yeah, sort of. We can sort of see you. Sort of see me? Uh-huh. So You'll you definitely know. hear me, so we're going to be all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to pray with you guys real quick. I know you guys are eating, so you guys just do your thing. But... Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, seeking your guidance and wisdom as we dive into your word. We ask 
for your presence to fill this place, that our hearts may be open to receive your message. Lord, speak through me and touch the lives of all that will hear these words, whether it be those present with us today or those who will be watching later online. As we gather here today, we want to thank you, God, for the gift of life and for this opportunity to worship you. We acknowledge your sovereignty knowing that you are the Alpha and the Omega. Yes, the Jesus. And the end, the creator yes, and the sustainer Lord. of all Hallelujah. things. Yes. In this sacred moment, we humbly ask for your guidance, your wisdom, and for your grace to be poured out upon us. As we open our hearts to receive your message, we pray that you would open our minds to understand the truths hidden within your words. Grant us discernment to perceive the depths of your wisdom and insight, that we may grow in our knowledge of you and be transformed. We recognize, Lord, that each person gathered and watching here today carries burdens, they carry doubts, and then struggles. We lift the pain that we are feeling up to you, our Lord, knowing that you are the great comforter. Touch every weary soul, bring healing to the brokenhearted, and fill yes, us with Jesus. your peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray these things and more of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I come to you today to give you a message of hope and a message of encouragement. The life that we find ourselves living in is a journey that is filled with ups and it's filled with downs. Victories and defeats, mountains and valleys. At times we may feel weary, discouraged, or even think that our lives are over. Can you hear me better back there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can hear you. Mike. He got almost eight the thing. Uh, and we may even get to the point that we think that God has forsaken us. Okay? But I want to tell you today that the plans that God has for your life are not completed yet. If you woke up today and you are here to have the opportunity to listen to this message, your story is not finished just yet. Today I bring you a message from God that it's not over. Um, you guys are eating, um, but if you want to have your Bibles, I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. And the Word of God says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on Him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast. If you guys remember a couple weeks ago, we had a pretty bad storm that hit us in the middle of the night. It actually flooded the church really bad. I know I know, Kim remembers that. Um, well, I was asleep at my house when this storm hit. And I'm going to get a little more into this later because it's, it's part of my testimony. But at the moment, I live in an RV camping trailer. Um, and this is not one of those big, like, Class A motorhomes. This is a literal camping trailer, okay, and uh, so you can imagine what, when the storm hit, I woke up, I'm laying in bed and I just wake up, the whole place is shaking and rattling, and uh, let me tell you, if you've never been in an RV during a big storm, um, I don't recommend it, it's uh, zero out of five stars, it is not a fun experience, um, the whole place was shaking, the walls are just, big. and I'm getting to the point where I feel like if the wind picks up just a little bit more, if it blows just a little bit harder, I'm, I'm a guard. This is not going to work, okay? And the storm goes on for hours on end. It's just merciless. The rain, the wind, the thunder, and the lightning. And while I was sitting on my bed, all shaking all around me, it suddenly gets kind of quiet. And everything kind of settles down. And I, I peeked out the window, and I saw, at the time, what was the most beautiful sight that I had ever seen. Hi, baby. I saw the most beautiful sight that I had ever seen, and it was the sun. Um, the sun had shown up. And uh, I'm standing in my yard, and I'm looking around at the flooding. I'm looking at the damage. I have a tree knocked over. I'm looking at these things. And um, I was mentally exhausted from going through this storm. And so I just wanted to go inside. The storm's over. I want to go inside. I'm going to take a, cold, a warm shower. And uh, I'm just going to sleep away the stress from the night before. But while I was in the shower standing there, uh, you know, the water pouring on top of me, something happened that made my heart stop. The whole house starts shaking again. Okay, the whole house starts rumbling and the storm has picked back up. And uh, now it's way worse, too. Come here, baby. Come here. Let me get down, please. <laughs> so, 
Oh, now the storm is way, way worse. And so this time the whole house is shaking, and I'm not confident that I'm going to make it through. So I get out, and I run off into this ditch. And I'm laying there, just just tucked into this ditch. And uh, so instead of getting to set comfy inside my bed right out the storm, this time I, I made a run for it, and I'm laying in the ditch. And uh, I, I don't know... Um, I don't know if you guys know the feeling of uh, laying in a ditch when a storm comes by, but it's not fun. Uh, it's a pretty uh, excruciating experience. And uh, but, but I made it through. I, I got The storm went away, and, and we had some flooding. We cleaned up the church. Everything turned out all right. So why am I telling you this story? Uh, what does this have to do with anything? When the storm died down and I walked outside, um, I found hope in, hope in the warmth of the sun. Okay? I saw the sun, and it gave me hope that the storm was over. Uh, but the problem was the storm wasn't over. It was a false hope. Okay, it wasn't real. We have storms all the time during the day, so the sun has no bearing whatsoever on the weather. But in the moment, it gave me a false hope that everything was going to be okay, that the storm was over. But right after that, a second front came in. Um, there are things in life that are going to come your way that are going to give you a false hope that the storm that you're going through is over. That the struggle that you are going through is about to end. And you need to prepare yourself for the fact that, guess what? The storm's not over yet. Okay? It's not over. There are still hard times to come. Back in 1 Peter, it told us, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a while, will himself redeem you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. After you have <laughs> suffered for a little while. As a human, guess what? Life's going to hurt. Come on. We are going to go through pain in life. Come on. You're going to go through storms. And they don't just show up and cause a little chaos and then leave. They are going to last a little while. They're going to stick around and they're going to linger. And you need to prepare yourself for the fact and brace yourself so that you can face it head on and not fall completely apart when it happens. Okay, And when that storm doubles back down and hits you twice as hard as the first time. And here's something that those, those things that, that give you a false hope, sometimes those things are of God. They're of God. And, and I know that sounds like a trick, right? This thing happens, it gives me hope. I thought the storm was over, but now it's not. Yes, that can be of God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really blow your mind here for a second. I'm going to read to you out of Matthew. Uh, this is going to be chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Oh, yeah. And straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus said unto them, walking into the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out of fear. But straight away Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee onto the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind... Boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming onto the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. So, Check this out. Jesus fed a multitude of people with just five loaves of bread and two fish, right? And after that, he tells his disciples to go out into this ship. And while they're out there, while they're trying to get across, this huge storm blows in. And it gets wicked scary. Wind is blowing. Waves are crashing. And, and let me tell you this, guys. This is not some huge modern cruise ship that when you hear the word ship, you're it's a wooden boat. Okay? It's a wooden boat. This storm would have been scary for them. Petrifying. Okay? 
And, and in the middle of this, they look out and they see Jesus literally walking on water towards them. The most bizarre thing you could ever imagine seeing. And it, and it, scares, them. it scares them. They don't even know if it's him. They think it, it's a, a, a spirit of some sort. So this guy, Peter, he basically says to him, like, hey, Jesus, if that's really you, call on to me. Come call me to you. What can he say? And Jesus says, okay, come. So, so Peter gets out of the boat and he steps onto the water. And he finds solid ground. He starts walking. He takes one step. He takes two steps. And he starts walking towards Jesus. Now, I can imagine at this moment, he's pretty hopeful that the storm is over. Jesus has just walked on water. And now he's walking on water straight towards Jesus. Now, it's about that time that Peter looks around. And he sees these waves crashing. And he sees everything coming around. Uh, lightning, the thunder, and and it, Scripture says that as Peter walked towards Jesus, he looked around and saw the waves crash around around them. And then, at that time, he took his focus off of Jesus and he began to sink into the water. the The standing solid ground that he had been on was no longer solid. And he begins to sink. Now, I can imagine the storm in the boat was scary, but at least there was some form of relative safe feeling inside a boat. Now he's standing waist deep in water, sinking more and more and more. Just when he thought the storm was over, it comes back double, and now he's getting hit ten times as hard. And he doesn't even have the boat for safety at this point. Now, Jesus, of course, saves the day. He takes Peter's hand, he pulls them both up into the boat, and it was then that the wind ceased and the storm dissipated into nothingness. Now, in this life, storms are going to come your way are going to stink. They don't feel good. And sometimes just when you think the storm is over, something is going to come along and smack you around. And it's going to let you know that that storm isn't even close to over yet. That the scariest moments of the storm are yet to come. And guess what? That's okay. It doesn't feel like it at the time, but it's okay. Back in Peter, it told us, and the, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So look, this is good at all. This is good. But what does it mean? Okay, Storms are going to come, and it will feel like it's over, but sometimes it's not. And we are going to... to to maybe go through actually worse parts than before. Worse than what we've already went through, which is hard to imagine for some of us. I, we live in Scott City. Some of you guys in this room have been through some pain. Some of you guys in this room know about loss. You know about sickness. You know about hurt. You know about being ripped out of a life that you thought you had and being thrown into a totally different life and having no, no feelings of where to go from that. And God tells us that it's okay. He tells us he's going to redeem us after we've suffered a little, a little while. But, but how do we do that? How do we keep going when it feels hopeless? When you've already been through so much pain, so much hurt, and your heart is just completely broken. How do you possibly keep going? Because I don't know about you guys, but I've been through some stuff. That left me feeling like I'm feeling like I was never gonna make it through. <laughs> like, like I had literally no hope left. So how do we keep going when the storms we have faced break us to the point that we don't feel like we can keep going? What do we do and where do we turn? Yeah. yeah. This is where we turn. Yeah. When the storm of your life is raging. Just like with Peter sinking into the water, there's nowhere left to turn but to Jesus and his word. And this book is just crammed full of the stuff that we need in these moments. Yeah. It's full of it. It's just full of it. In, in Jeremiah, Scripture tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when yeah. you seek me with all of your heart. Yeah. Amen. I will be found by you. In Hebrews it tells us, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of uh, witnesses, let us lay aside our weight 
and the sin which is so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. In Genesis, we learn about Joseph. Now, Joseph's, Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery, okay, to live out the rest of his life in chains. But God used his sufferings to ultimately position Joseph to be a powerful leader in Egypt, saving many lives during a severe famine. And Joseph even said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And of course, we all know the story of Job. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. Despite enduring unimaginable suffering, Job maintained faithful to God. And in the end, he was abundantly blessed. And his fortunes were restored. And there's Moses. Moses is told by God to lead his people out of slavery. Moses does this, leads them on a long journey of, towards their freedom, only to come to the banks of a large sea, and they've got no boats and no way across. Now, I can imagine at that moment, Moses probably thought, well, this is awesome. I led them to their death. Okay? But in the end, the sea was parted by God, and Moses and his people made it safely to the other side. In the book of Daniel, Daniel, um, we learn about a guy who was basically arrested for praying. Okay? A decree was issued that said for 30 days you could pray to no gods or beings other than the king. And Daniel prays to God anyway, because that's what Daniel does. Daniel doesn't, Daniel's good. He's got, he's got the courage, he's going to do it anyway, right? Yeah. So they throw him in a den, of, a den of lions, of hungry lions. This is a form of punishment back then. And uh, in chapter 6, verse 22, it says, For my God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not harmed me. And then there's Jesus. Jesus' walk on earth, especially the last part, was not an easy one. He was beaten, and he was lashed on his back to the point that the lashes alone could have and should have probably caused his death. And then they forced him to carry a cross up a big hill, and then they hung him on that very same cross until he took his very last breath. Luke 23, 46 says, Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I, and having said this, he breathed his last. Listen, death is, is about the worst storm I could, I could, I could imagine. Um, and it was such a strong force that it even took Jesus. It, it even took Jesus' life. Yeah. But Matthew 28, verse 5 through 6 says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. <laughs> He is not here, for he has risen, and as he said, come see the place where he lay. Luke 24, chapter 6, or 24, 6 through 7 says, he is not here, but has risen. Remember, he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered onto the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise. Even Jesus could not accept that, could not escape storms. Even Jesus could not escape death. Even Jesus could not completely avoid this storm. But there is a power of resurrection and deliverance yes. from our God. Hallelujah. And at the very core of our faith lies the power of that resurrection. Yeah. Hey. We believe in a God and a risen Savior who conquered sin and death. And, and, and through his resurrection, he offers us new life. This same power that raised Jesus from the dead is literally available to all of us Right now, today, exactly. it's not this. This this stuff didn't stop two thousand years ago. This isn't just in the Old Testament. That same power that helped raise Jesus from the dead is available to each and every single one of us, and it's available to us to help enable us to rise above our circumstances and experience the transformative power of God in our lives. Romans chapter eight verse eleven says, "If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you." He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now this, this concept that we've been talking about so far tonight, this, this concept of it's not over, it's a perfect representation of the power that we have inside of us. The same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the grave is available to us to help raise us from the dead when the storms of life, they break us down. 
we don't have to just accept that, that the storm that we're going through is where we're stuck at in our lives. It may be a season, and tough seasons are going to come. First Peter told us that earlier. But we don't have to just stand by and accept that that's the sentence for the rest of our life. We don't have to let a season become a life sentence. We don't... I wasn't... I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to do this part yet. Um, but I just feel really led to, to share a couple things here. Um, I'm going to testify for a second about something. Can I testify for you guys? Yeah. yeah. I was going to do it anyway. I just want to ask permission to make sure we're all okay. I was going to do it anyway. Though. So, some of you guys know me. There's a couple people here that I've seen. And some of you guys I've never seen before. Um, but I've not, I haven't always believed in God. Um, I was an atheist for the majority of my adult life. I was an ardent atheist. I went out of my way to, to persecute Christians in a lot of ways. Online, especially on Facebook, places like that, in person. I love debating Christians and trying to belittle them and make them feel silly for what they believe. Um, and, and in that spell of my life, I dealt with drug use, I dealt with alcoholism, homelessness, literally all of the worst parts of the Bible in some ways, that's what my life was at that moment, at that time. And I went through some things that really made me think and start to question my belief system, my, my belief in the science, my belief in not needing a God. And I was, I was given the opportunity to go to this church in Cape. And I didn't go to this church to find God. I had no intention of finding God there. I went specifically because I thought that, you know, these church people got figured out. Most of them got big houses. They've got nice jobs. They make money. They've got good habits. If I could just spend some time with them, maybe some of them habits would rub off. I don't need the God part. I'll leave that to them. But if I could just get around some Jesus people, the good stuff would rub off, and I could use that. And I was there, this pastor preach the message, and right in the middle of it, he just stops. And he like stares at me like hardcore, and he's just... And it gets really awkward at that part, because he stops for like 50 seconds. You know, and, and when you've got a pastor that's going and going and going, and all of a sudden he just stops and stares at someone, I'm like, who's this guy staring at? Like, I'm going to get up and run to the bathroom, I'm getting out of here. Like, but he says, why don't you just give Jesus a try once in your life? He said, you've tried everything else. You've tried the science, you've tried the drugs, you've tried everything else that this world has to offer. Why don't you just give Jesus a try one time? And that really messed me up as an educated atheist. Because I believe in, in I believe in the, the scientific theory, okay? Now, how can I sit here and tell this Christian he's wrong if I've never even tried what he's putting out? So he really hooked me there. And so that next Saturday, I go in this little closet. I live in this one little little bedroom apartment, and I go in this closet, and I didn't even know how to pray to God, and I didn't I didn't believe in God at the time, so it was probably the like funkiest prayer you ever heard. But I just I just kind of told them that like, man, I don't believe in you, and I don't believe that you exist. But if you do, if there's some chance that you're real. Right now would be the moment to show that to me because I don't have anything left. If you don't reveal yourself to me, I'm not going to make it. And I don't just mean like I'm not going to make it through the night and it's going to be a bad night, but I'll be okay tomorrow. If you don't give me something, I'm not going to make it. I have nothing left to give. And it wasn't, it wasn't this cool burning bush moment. The, the apartment complex roof didn't explode and God didn't show himself to me right there. That, that probably would have been scary, but the next, the next week, I got invited back to this church again. It was, or the next day, excuse me, that was Saturday night. It was the next day. And I didn't want to go. I had no plans on going back, but I, I got invited and I thought, well, again, this whole getting around Christian thing can't be a bad deal. So I go and they have a guy, an evangelist from Arizona, actually. Um, I still talk to this guy now, but 
He's never been to Cape. He's never been here. He doesn't know anybody here. He had been our, the pastor of that church had found him on on Facebook and had been shown him by another friend. So this is his first time being here. This guy knows nothing about me. And, and if you guys know anything about Pentecostals, their services get just a little bit wild. We're kind of Baptists here in some ways. We we got a little bit of both sides of it. The Pentecostals get a little crazy. So this service was nuts. And I'm not going to lie to you, I wanted no part of any of it. I wanted to run. These people are talking in tongues, putting hands on each other, and I'm like, oh, i got to get out of here. This is, these people are crazy. So this guy who is a really good friend of mine now, he comes up and he says, uh, hey, would you mind if I pray for you? Can I, can I bring you out here? Can I pray for you? And in my head, I'm like, mm -hmm. No, sir, I don't want any of what you guys are doing. But, you know, I don't be rude. I'm like, oh. if, it, if it makes this guy feel better, I can grip my teeth, I can shut my eyes, and I can deal with it for about 40 seconds. No big deal. So he takes me up closer to the altar, and he puts hands on me, and he's got his hand on my shoulder, and he's praying and talking Swahili is what it sounds like to me. I don't even know, I don't even know Spanish. So I'm like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. That's making me very uncomfortable. And... About that time, like 40 Pentecostals surrounded me. Like 40 of them come running up, and now there's like 50 or 60 hands laying on me. And I'm like, oh, this is nuts. Like, that, this is, I got myself way over my head here. So I gritted my teeth and closed my eyes and prayed to a God I did not exist in to make this stop. That is what I did. And in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of all these people touching me, I felt somebody touch my forehead. And it was a different feeling than the rest of them. It was a different experience, and it made me want to open my eyes. And I opened my eyes, and it was this evangelist from Arizona. And he had his hands on my head, and he was praying. And he reached in, and he whispered in my ear. And in more than one words, what he told me was, the things that you're holding on to, God already forgave you for them. The things that you're not willing to let go, he already let it go. And he's got work for you now. So it's time for you to let this go and move forward. Now, a prayer that I had prayed the night before, it was a lot more to it than what I told you guys here, but that evangelist saying the things that he said to me, it might as well have been God himself saying those to me. When I asked God to show himself to me, in my heart, he did. In a way that changed me fundamentally. It changed me. I went in the stroke of a single moment. In the time it takes from the clock hand to move from one minute to two to the second minute. In a, just a split second, I went from being a bitter, hate-filled atheist to a true believer. With the faith of a thousand men. It, it was so quick. It was so... I, I felt it. It was, like, it was like pouring a glass of water or warm water over you. I felt it just... I, it was nuts. And I walked around for about a week, like three foot above the ground. The grass smelled better. The, the, the sky was more blue than I'd ever seen. Everything smelled good. We went to Logan's Roadhouse. The steak was the best smelling steak I'd ever smelled in my life that week. I swear to you. And <laughs> so it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. And it set me up. It set me up for failure in a lot of ways. Because as a young person in Christ, as a young person, based on my maturity level and my relationship with God, I somehow tricked myself into thinking that, well, I got Jesus now. My life's going to be great forever. My life is going to, I've got Jesus now. And for a while it was. When I got saved, my life went, it was a rocket ship. I went from making, I was making like eight twenty-five dollars an hour to making hundred grand a year. In three months after I got saved, I bought a house. I, my life for about three years after I got saved was a straight rocket ship to the moon. And it felt like nothing I did could go wrong. And, and that gave me a sense of hope that the storms that I had gone through in life as an atheist, it gave me a sense of hope that the storms that I had experienced when I didn't have God were gone. And I would not have to experience those kind of things again. And, and then... Then everything fell apart. I went through a very unexpected divorce that to say that it to say that it broke who I was would be an understatement. To say that it 
sent me into a depression that I really didn't think I would ever get out of is, it's not it's, put, it's putting it mildly, I don't even have words to describe those first few months because it just shocked me so much. The thing I don't, I grew up in a divorced household and the thing I always wanted was to ensure that my kids had a mom and a dad and that. And then it was just gone. I, literally, I left her church on a Sunday morning and it was there. We were the youth pastor of, the, of this church, as a matter of fact. And by the time I got home, the house was empty. And I just sat there on the couch wondering how this had happened. A couple months after that, my dad died from COVID. And, and for a couple of years, it seemed that no matter what I did, no matter how hard I tried, nothing could go right. No matter what I did, no matter how hard I tried, everything went wrong. I bought a car that I thought was going to last me for the next 20 years. I park it. Well, I only had it a couple months. I park it one night, and of all things, it it didn't start the next day, so I called this mechanic guy. Of all things, mice had gotten up under the hood and chewed through a wiring harness. Now, if this car had been a Ford Focus, it would have cost $400 to fix, but because it was a Jaguar, it cost $4,000 for me to fix. So now I don't have a car. I had started building I had started building this cabin that every bit of it, every detail, everything about it, the, the color of the floors, the walls, the paint, the color, everything about it was what I wanted and designed it that way. And then I had to let that go and move back in with my mom for a little bit. Well, then she and her, my stepdad get a chance to buy a piece of property out in Whitewater and they're moving out of town. So now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do next. So then I buy this camping trailer. And I get down there in this camping trailer. I don't even have electricity down there. Like this property, I don't even have electricity there. I'm using, for two months, I used a generator. And I was just really meticulous about how much gas I used. Now, I was really lucky because it was still pretty chilly that time of year. And I had a propane heater that I used to heat the stuff. But then spring hits and I get that stuff taken care of. But I tell you guys parts of this because... I know what it feels like to feel pain. The kind of pain that just breaks you and leaves you without an identity. Who are you when what you believed your, you were, your role in life, husband, father, mother, wife, maybe you lose a parent, whatever your role in life was that you've accepted of yourself, who, who are you when that's taken from you? What are you then? You have no identity. Unless you've got your priorities right and your identity comes through Christ. But at the time, I didn't have that. I made a huge mistake in the fact that, I, you know, a pastor told me one time, it was nuts, right after I got saved, he said, in my house, I have this hierarchy. It's God, wife, kids, and everything filters down from there. And I said, you, hold on, man. You're telling me you put God above your wife? I can't imagine she likes that too much. And he said, no, 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 you're not getting it. He said, by putting God first in my household, I am putting my wife first. That's right. That's it. By putting God first in my household, I am putting my wife and my children first. That's what I didn't understand that. I tried to put all these other things in place first. And then God came in. And so when those things are all taken from me, now I have no identity. I don't know who I am. Who am I? What am I doing here? Well, the purpose I thought I had is gone. Everything that I thought I had is there. Now it's gone. And I tell you these things because, again, we don't have to just accept that the things that are thrown in our life, that the things that are thrown in our life are permanent. We don't have to just accept them just because they come. We can't stop the storms. We can't stop them from coming. But we do not have to accept that that's, that's the rest of our lives. Sometimes you've literally just got to tell the devil no. Yes. Have, have you ever just told the devil off? I mean, told the devil off. I, I'm, I'm talking, I, this happened just a few weeks ago after that storm. The next morning I'm sitting in the front yard after it's all over and I just started shaking. I, I just started looking around after this huge storm and I just started screaming. I was I, actually when it was all over. I was afraid that neighbors heard it and called the cops because I mean they they thought an episode of cops. I was screaming. I was screaming at him that no, 
You try to take my life, but I'm still here. You have no authority here. This is my land. You don't get to take my life. You don't get to take my wife from me. You don't get to take my kids. You don't get to take my soul. You get nothing. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You are not welcome here. Go back to hell where you belong. Amen, brother. And sometimes that's what you have to do. No matter how much the devil, no matter how much the life, no matter how much those things attack you, sometimes you just have to tell them no. It doesn't matter what you throw my way, I'm not giving up. It doesn't matter what you put in my path, I'm not going to stop. At the end of the day, no matter how hard you fight against me, I am wearing the armor of God, and I'm not going to back down. So, so keep going. Fine. Keep going as far as you want. You've taken everything else from me. Keep going. It doesn't matter. Because tonight when I lay my head down, yes. I'm going to thank Jesus Christ for the fact that I'm still here. I can promise you that no matter how hard the pain that you go through feels, no matter how hard you have to struggle to get through in life. I can promise you that it's not over. Your life is not over yet. There is hope in Jesus. There is hope in our God. There's hope in the fact that if we don't give up, there's hope in the fact that if we don't give up and we just put our faith in God, we're going to make it through. We don't have to be the kind of Christians who sit back in our chairs every single Sunday and hope that the blessings of God come our way. We don't have to be the kind of Christians who sit in our chairs and hope that God hears our cries. We do not have to be the kind of Christians who just sit back in our chairs and hope that God keeps his promises. We can be the kind of Christians who stand up, throw our hands in the air and say, as for me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. We can be the kind of Christians who stand up and say, devil, you have no authority over here. We can be the kind of Christians who stand up, put our hands in the air and say, I give my heart to you, Jesus. I know it hurts. And I know that the pain of life can make you feel like it will never end. But I tell you with a full heart of faith that no matter how bad the storm is in your life, if you're listening to me right now, here in this room or on Facebook, it's not over. Don't let go. Don't give up. Don't look around. Look straight to Jesus. Keep your focus. Look straight to Jesus and give him your heart. Because through him, it's not over. You guys, for those of you who want to stand. God, as we come to the end of this message, if we, as we come to the end of this time of worship and teaching, we lift our hearts in gratitude for the profound truths that have been revealed to us in this place. We thank you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit who has spoken directly to our souls and illuminated our minds with the wisdom and understanding that you garn for us. We stand in awe of your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to guide our path. And Lord, we recognize that we are weak and prone to wander. But you are a faithful and steadfast servant. As we leave this place, we ask for you, for your grace to empower us to live out the truths that we have learned today. May the seeds of your word take root in our heart and bear fruit that glorifies your name. Strengthen our resolve to walk in obedience even when the path is difficult and the world around us tempts us to give up. We pray for those among us who are facing trials and hardships, God. May you please comfort and surround them like a warm embrace, reminding them that they are never, ever alone. Grant them strength and endurance to persevere knowing that you are working all things together for their good. Fill their hearts with hope and assurance that your plans for them are always perfect. Lord, we lift up our leaders to you, both in our church and in our communities and in our governments. Grant them wisdom to make decisions that honor you and benefit those they serve. Give them discernment to distinguish between good and evil and the courage to stand for righteousness in a world that often rejects your truth. May their lives and the way that they treat others be a testament to your love and grace, drawing others into a relationship with you. 
Father, we pray for unity among our people. Help us set aside our differences and embrace the bond of peace that you have called us to. Teach us, God, to love one another as you have loved us, so that the world may know that we are your disciples. Let our actions speak louder than our words, demonstrating your love and compassion to a hurting and broken world. And as we go from this place, may your presence go with us. Fill our hearts with a deep sense of awe and reverence for you. May we carry the light of your truth into the every corner of our lives, shining brightly in the darkness and pointing others to your salvation. Use us, Lord. Use us as your vessels for your grace and instruments of your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. You guys are now dismissed. And go forth and show love to the world as God has shown us. Yeah. And don't ever give up don't give because up. it's not over. Come on.